You know, there was a guy at a high school in North Carolina years ago, and a guy liked basketball. He was a good, halfway decent athlete, and went out for the team, and he got cut. And they sent him down to JV ball. You know, the guy had the heart, but he didn't have the skill. You know, two years later, that same guy that sat in that locker room dejected was named a McDonald's High School All-American basketball player. A couple years later, that same locker room is now named after that guy. It's called the Michael Jordan Gymnasium. In between getting cut and sent down to JV and being inducted into the Professional Basketball Hall of Fame, Michael Jordan made excellence on the court his standard. He practiced, he worked, he committed, he dedicated. Excellence became his standard. What I want to encourage you today through this message is that we've got to make the miraculous our daily standard. We should expect the miraculous every day. Why? Because we are supernatural. We have the supernatural God indwelled in us. One third of us is perfect by the righteousness of God through the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We should wake up in the miraculous. We should be the miraculous. We should receive the miraculous. And we should be conduits, vessels, to pour out the miraculous. I am encouraging you today. The one thing the Lord put on my heart is we are called to do the miraculous through the same supernatural power that Jesus had. And that's the Holy Spirit. If it was anything else, it would be impossible. But through God, all things are possible. Because you have the same power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you that Jesus did, that God used to raise him. You are miraculous. You see, God's kingdom can't grow unless you know the wonder-working power of Jesus Christ. So if we'll stand as the body and we'll read our anchor scripture, which is that power, and we'll read together as the body. It comes from Mark 1, 29, 31. It says, Jesus heals many people. And together, after Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon and Andrew's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. So he went to her bedside, took her by the hand, and helped her sit up. Then the fever left her, and she prepared a meal for them. That evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. But because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. This is our anchor scripture, and it's a good word because it's a word from the Lord. We're continuing through the, through the gospel of Mark. And I believe, I know it's important to walk through entire books of the Bible so nothing is taken out of context. In its completion, it's perfect. So we'll begin with Mark 129, and I'll read it. It said, after Jesus left the synagogue, remember last week we talked about what was a synagogue. It were local gathering places. It's not the temple, it's a synagogue. It's where Jesus would go and they would use for, uh, for religious gatherings and school and market and social. It was the national identity for the nation of Israel, the same way that our, our local churches are. So after Jesus left the synagogue, you remember last week we talked about what did he do in the synagogue? He had just he delivered a man from demonic possession. So he just finished with his first demonic deliverance. And then he and James and John went to Simon and Andrew's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. So he went to her bedside, took her by the hand, and helped her sit up. Then the fever left her, and she prepared a meal for them. What I want to encourage you to understand is that, like, when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law, it wasn't a big production. There were no selfies. There was no light show. There was no microphone, handless mic on Jesus' face. Like, Jesus just did it because that's who Jesus was. And that's who Jesus came to be. That's what he came to do. What I want to encourage you is Jesus did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the same power living inside of you. Like, Jesus didn't get, like, 100% Holy Spirit. And because you showed up late for church, you get, like, 75% Holy Spirit. You're 100% righteous in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus healed the mother-in-law because that's who Jesus was. That's who you are. 
I want to encourage you to, to understand your power. You know, when we talk about that power, it comes from the Greek word kratos. And that word kratos is mighty, power, force, dominion. It is an outward, tangible demonstration of the power of God. I want to give an example of how powerful it is. In John 18, uh, 3, 6, when they went to arrest Jesus in the garden, it said the leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized what was going to happen to him. So we stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? He asked. Jesus, the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, he said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Now, what I want to tell you, in the Greek, the word contingent is the word uh, spira. And that means about 600 Roman soldiers. You see, it wasn't just a few guys in the cover of darkness that went to arrest Jesus. Like Judas had 600 soldiers. Elite Roman soldiers in the cover of darkness to arrest Jesus. So I want you to get the picture. And I want you to understand the power that you have. The Kratos power that you have. When Jesus simply said, I am he. And when, when it says, they, and they fall to the ground. That word from Greek, it means to fall down as if dead. To fall in ruin. I love it. To become null and void. What we call today, they were slain in the Spirit. They were slain in the Spirit. In the power of the Spirit of God. The Kratos power. The same power that was used to raise Jesus from the dead. The Kratos power is an outward, tangible, demonstrable power that is seen. When Moses stood at the waters of the Red Sea, it was the Kratos power. That separated those waters. When you have decisions to make in your life. And you're wondering do I do this or do I do that. And you decide the right. That is Kratos power. That is demonstrable. Tangible power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had it. You have it. But I want to tell you. It's like, well, How do I activate this power? How do I knock down 600 of my most fierce enemies? Goodness gracious. How do I knock down one? How do I get rid of that giant? Through Kratos power. You see, you've got, to, you've got to understand that you've got the power. You've got to be willing to exercise the power. You see, this kind of power cannot be contained in a shaky vessel. If you live in your life and there's sin in your life and it's not righteous and, and you're not really sure. Like this is power. And this power cannot be contained or executed through a shaky vessel. We've got to come into living righteous. But what I want you to do is start turning up your level of expectation. We go to conferences and we see other people minister and we're like, oh, that's so good. I mean, how do they do that? How they do it is that they've got the same power living in them that you got living in you. But they have an expectation for the execution of that power. They understand that it's not them doing it. It's God doing it through them. And they allow themselves to be used. I want you to start anticipating that God's Kratos power is going to flow through you. You've already got it inside of you. If you've received Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, you've got the power. Just what are you going to do with it? I want to encourage you. Start expecting the miraculous. Do the miraculous because you are the miraculous. So we continue to Mark 130, uh, Mark 130. Then Jesus, uh, then they told Jesus about her right away. So he went to her bedside, took her by the hand and helped her sit up. Then the fever left her and she prepared a meal for them. See, the disciples didn't hesitate to submit uh, this healing request to Jesus. They weren't like, oh, what are people going to think about me? You know, am I going to get a like on social media if I put out a prayer request? You see, you can't approach healing with hesitation. You've got to walk in the confidence of Christ. You can't sit there and figure like, what if it don't work? 
What if it doesn't happen? What if it doesn't look the way I think it's supposed to look like? You can't come to the throne like that. It's not a production. It's just what you do. Not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. I don't care how long you've been saved. You've got the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. I want you to start understanding that healing comes naturally supernatural because you're supernatural, because of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But where do we fail? The truth is we fail in our belief. We understand academically, theologically, that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We know that one-third of us, our spirit is 100% perfect righteousness. Like you can't get no more righteous than 100% righteous. Now, your, your, your soul, which is your emotions, your feelings, like that's working on sanctification, the process of sanctification, being less emotion-driven, more spirit-driven. And of course, your body, that's a work in progress too. But that is the physical house. That is the, the temple of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But what's perfect in you right now is your spirit. I joke sometimes, say, well, Leah's like, well, you ain't perfect. I'm like, well, one-third of me is. She's like, well, let's work on the other two-thirds. And I'm like, I got you. But our problem is we understand that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Where we fail is our belief. Do you believe that you could lay hands on the sick and heal them? Do you believe you could, you could lay hands on the dead and raise them? Do you believe you could lay hands on someone and you could cast out the demons? Do you believe you have that authority? You're like, well, the Bible says, and I watched a TikTok video, but I just don't know. And that's where we short-circuit ourselves, you see. Matthew 17 tells us, so Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So then we hear people all the time, and they're like, not all the time. They're like, seriously? Seriously, I have never seen a mountain move. Maybe that mountain's being moved rock by rock by rock. Maybe that insurmountable challenge in your life just gets a little smaller and a little smaller and a little smaller. Just like your health crisis, healing can be an instantaneous miracle. Lazarus, get up, come out of that grave. Or it's a process. It's a process. But where we short-circuit the process is we don't believe. I know what the Bible says, but I don't know if I believe it. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Like Jesus is not playing tricks. He's not giving you the example of, I healed his mother-in-law, but y'all can't do it. That's not it. He healed the mother-in-law because he had the Holy Spirit inside of him. You have the same Holy Spirit inside of you. But you've got to believe that you can lay hands and heal the sick. You've got to believe that you can raise the dead. You've got to believe that you can cast out demons. You've got to believe that you've got the, kings, the keys to the kingdom. That you can bind and you can loose. But you've got to come with confidence. And you've got to come with boldness. You see Mark 4.31? He said, then the fever left her and she prepared a meal for them. If we believe that we're healed... We've got, to manifest death. We've got to manifest that healing. Like, what if that old girl had been like, that's cool, but I'm going to get a second opinion. Like, I'm waiting for Baylor Scott White to call me back with some blood work. But I appreciate you, Jesus, but I'm going to lay here for a bit. You see, you've got, to, you've got to manifest the healing. Sometimes that healing does take the physical restoration of your body. Sometimes the inflammation in your body has got to be allowed to naturally, physically uh, be resolved. But the healing, the healing was guaranteed to you back in Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded, he, Jesus, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He, again, Jesus, was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of, for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So let's bring a little current to the New Testament. 1 Peter 2. Who himself, we're talking about Jesus, bore our sins on his body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. And again, 
by whose stripes you were healed. Were healed. Not maybe healed. Maybe going to be healed. Maybe if this one prays for me instead of that one prays for me, I could get healed. You were healed. You've got to receive the truth of the word. You've got to stand in the boldness of the manifestation of healing. If the mother-in-law had just laid back in bed, she doesn't begin the process of the physical manifestation of the healing. She's healed. She's got to receive the healing. I just want to ask, no raise of hands, but do you believe that Jesus healed people? Do you believe you have the same power to heal? I mean, it's illogical. He had the Holy Spirit. This is not a trick. Jesus had the Holy Spirit. Remember, when he was baptized by John, the Holy Spirit comes down. His Father God affirms him. Jesus has the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the same power. So do you believe Jesus healed people? Do you believe you have the same power to heal people? Then I ask, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? How many times have we had the, have we had the, the opportunity to lay hands on somebody? And we're like, I don't know. Then you short-circuited yourself. Or maybe if somebody else came by with more Holy Spirit in them. It's not an issue of more Holy Spirit. It's how much less of you there is. So there's more of the Holy Spirit that comes through you. That Kratos power doesn't radiate from a shaky vessel. So Mark 132. That evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases. And he cast out many demons. But because of the demons who knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. Now I'll tell you, in, in Luke, which is the parallel story because it's a synoptic gospel. Remember we talked about that. Matthew, Matthew um, Mark, and Luke, they're synoptic gospels. They all run pretty much parallel in the same stories. Different perspectives. You'll have some slight variations, but all the truth. So in Luke, it says he healed all the people. Like everybody got healed. Like, understand, Jesus healed and delivered everybody that came to him. He didn't sit. He didn't weigh. He didn't wonder. And you know, a lot of times, those, those uh, physical healings were a result of demonic deliverance. A lot of our physical health issues are a result of demonic oppression, uh, depression. You know, when people say, well, you know, my anxiety is so high today. That's not your anxiety. You know, my depression has really been getting me down. That is not your depression. God did not give you depression. God did not give you anxiety. You know, y'all, I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid. 2 Timothy 1.7, what does God say? For I that's God, did not give you a spirit of fear. Where'd that spirit come from? It's not from the Lord. Cast it out. Cast it out. A lot of our physical ailments come from demonic oppression because now we take on despair and depression and worry and perversion and addiction. My addiction is not your addiction. It did not come from God. You take authority by the blood of Jesus and you cast it out. You know, I want to ask you, how many times has God given you a word and given you an opportunity to pray for somebody? And we hesitate. What are they going to think of me? What are they going to say? I'm just saying that God's not looking to honor your pedigree. God doesn't care if you went to a two-year Bible college. God doesn't care if you have a, a doctorate in theology. I'll tell you, you know, I have, a, I have a doctorate in anthropology, which means nothing. But I thought when the Lord said, Pastor, I got I to gotta go get an education. I got to get a degree from a seminary. So it was, the, it was the doctor of ministry. And I'm sitting there and there's this big welcome. And you, they said, well, would all the demons stand up? And everybody stood up. I'm like, demons? Doctor, ministry, D, men, demons? I'm like, what am I doing? And the Lord's like, yeah, what are you doing? You don't need this. You need to get out of here. And I left. I left. <laughs> you don't have to wait for somebody with a degree. You don't have to wait with somebody with a pedigree. 
You got the same Holy Spirit living inside of you. If the Holy Spirit says pray for somebody, you pray for somebody. God doesn't honor your earthly accolades. God honors your surrender. God honors your yes. And if your yes comes with a beating heart and a, and, and a dry mouth, God's going to honor that because he's going to supply. You think Gideon was the warrior to, to, to liberate the nation? No. But God provided. Why? Because that old boy said yes. All we've got to do is say yes. But I'm going to tell you, a lot of times, this is particularly about healing. And it relates to deliverance. Because Jesus didn't, okay, everybody that's sick over here, everybody possessed over there. No. Everything is the ministry of Jesus. Oh, I got a deliverance ministry. Oh, I got a healing ministry. Mm. Now, that ain't the ministry of Jesus Christ. The gospel, the ministry of Christ encompasses everything. So I'm just asking you to, to stop becoming a niche player. Well, I only play offense. Well, I'm a defensive. No, no, no. If you want in the arena and you want to you play the game for the gospel, for the kingdom... You've got to be an all-around player. So when God asks you to heal somebody or God asks you to step in and provide deliverance for somebody, you've got to be willing to do that. I'm going to tell you, a couple years ago, I'm sitting in a church, and I heard a pastor. I heard a pastor on the pulpit say, I don't do hospital visits. I don't, I don't pray for the sick. Because what if it don't work? And what are people going to think of me? And look, the Holy Spirit punched me in the gut and said, you've got to get out of this church. But let me be honest with you. How many of us feel the same way? Well, what if they don't get better? What if they don't get better? What's that going to look like on me? All God wants you to do is surrender your yes. You act in faith, and God's going to do the rest. Like, God don't need you to heal that person. God's trying to help you with you by praying for people. But if we sit on the sideline and we're waiting, man, the only way you know, the only way you get in shape is to go get in shape. Look, that Kratos power, we've all got it. Like, like, we should be like, oh my gosh, like everybody in this room has that, that crazy, tangible power. Like, it's amazing, the power that we all contain. But we've got to understand that God wants us to use it. We can't be a shaky vessel. We can't be afraid. We can't be afraid to pray for somebody because what they're going to think about us. We can't be afraid to when somebody's, when somebody, we know that they're manifesting. We can't be afraid of what they're going to think about us. Well, what if it don't work? What if the demon jumps on me? That's another conversation. I just want you to stand strong, to stand firm. Understand the power that you have. And y'all, those folks with the heart to evangelize, which is everything, the Great Commission, you've got to be prepared to heal and deliver. Jesus was out sharing the gospel. And what did he do? He healed and delivered. So then we get to the, to the messianic secret. In Luke 4, 41, it says, and this is all part of when Jesus was healing, it said, and he, and he rebuking them did not allow them to speak for they knew he was Christ. This is the demons. We saw it in the church, in the synagogue, when Jesus cast out the demon. He goes, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And Jesus said, be muzzled. In the Greek, it means shut up and get out. Because see, that's what demons are going to do. Demons want to disrupt your timeline. There's a messianic secret. Jesus had a timeline. Jesus had metrics, in today's term, to meet before it was time for him to be arrested, crucified, resurrected. But demons didn't want that to happen, you see. And demons were wanting to tell everybody, oh, that's Jesus right there. That's the Messiah, you see. And he wanted to take Jesus' focus off of what he was called to do and have to worry about them. See, in your ministry, in your life, in your marriage, in your money, in everything we do, the demons want to, they want to get you off track. We want to get you off track. And I'm not proposing that there's a demon behind every rock. But a lot of the warfare that we fight, most of it, is in our mind. We start worrying about things. Is this demon going to tell people who I am? If I've been told to pray over this person, what if they don't, what if they don't get healed? What if, we, what if we publicly declare that we're now praying for the second home that God promised us we'll have, and, and it's January 3rd, and we still don't have a home? Like, what are they going to think about me? You see, we can't be shaky vessels when we declare the word of the Lord, when we proclaim the promises of the Lord. That goes for proclaim, proclaiming his promises, or healing, or delivering, or sharing the good news of the gospel. 
All you got to do is say yes. But I want you to be aware that when you're out there and you're sharing the gospel and you take that step of faith, like that Satan's not happy. He's not applauding you. There will be resistance against your efforts. But you've got the Kratos power. You've got the, the dynamos power, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You are all about power of the Holy Spirit. But we hesitate sometimes because we're just not sure. We just don't believe. I'm asking you, believe. Believe. And if you have trouble believing, think back to the goodness of God. Let what God has done for you in the past stir up your faith today. You look at God's track record over the course of your life. And if that don't stir you up, I know, but you know, I had that issue. What happened to it? Well, it got resolved. Well, you know, we were broke. Well, what happened? Well, we, we got out of it, you know. Well, you know, my marriage, what happened? I thought we were going to divorce. What we still together. Like, look back over the course of your walk with Christ and allow the goodness of God to stir your faith in whatever you're going through today. In whatever you're going through today. Your mind is the battlefield. Your mind is Satan's battlefield. You know, when, when, Jesus, when Jesus would, not just the demons, but Jesus would tell people. He would heal them. And like, look, don't tell nobody, right? Don't tell nobody. But people wouldn't listen. They would go. They would go tell. For whatever their reasons, they would go tell. But I want to tell you, I want to encourage you. When the Lord tells you something, he puts it on your heart, and he asks you to keep it until the time's to reveal, honor God's word. And keep that word in your heart. Not everything God tells you is a conference call. Like God will tell you something and we'll ask 20 people what they think. And they'll give you their opinion. And now you've forgotten what the Lord told you. When the Lord gives you a word and asks you to keep it in your heart until the time comes for the manifestation or the revelation of that word, keep it in your heart. Keep it in your heart. You know, sometimes we get ahead of God's timing. And, and there's a couple different ways we do this. And, and sometimes it's just the zeal for doing God's will. You know, Lee and I used to be guilty of that. We get a little hint from the Lord, and we take off. We knew the will, but we didn't know the way. And we'd be out in the middle of nowhere like, come on, everybody's doing it. Where's everybody? And the Lord's like, I never said go. And our zeal for God's will, we got ahead of the Lord. Sometimes uh, zeal for anticipating God's will. Like, we'll listen about maybe about a half of what he says. I got it. I'm good. Just like our kids, right? I need you to do this. And before you say, and, they're gone. Y'all come back. Stand still. Stand still. When the Lord is talking to you, stand still and listen to everything he's got to tell you. Some, sometimes we've got a zeal for doing our own will. Sometimes, yeah, I know what you said, but this is what I want to do. And there's no grace and there's no favor when we walk outside the will of the Lord. And the other is just, just sometimes causing chaos, just like the demons do. Like, I know the Lord told y'all in the second year, he'd give you a new house for your church. But I really don't think y'all deserve it. I know the Lord told us to walk through the gospel of Mark. But I'm kind of tired of hearing about the gospel of Mark. Like, sometimes we inadvertently cause chaos in the midst of God's will. Let's really, be, let's really be mindful and be sensitive to what God's doing in our lives and what God's doing in other people's lives. Like, there's no honor in rebellion. There's no honor in walking outside the word of the Lord. And continuing through, Mark 1, 35, 39, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone's looking for you. And Jesus replied, you must go, we must go on to other towns as well. I will preach to them too. This is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in synagogues and casting out demons. See, what I want to, what I want to show is, is honoring God's word and making sure we're in his will. Like, what did Jesus do? Like, Jesus got up before daybreak. Jesus got up early, and he got up, and he went out to an isolated place to pray. Like, I'll submit to you. I don't think there's, there was anybody closer to God the Father than Jesus the Son. Still, he made time to pray. He made time to pray. I'm asking you, are you willing to give up your time for Jesus? Are you willing to get up early 
to go to an isolated place and pray. I will tell you that laying in bed and hitting snooze and dozing off in between your prayer requests is not honoring God's word. And then we wonder, well, I don't hear from him. No, because you've hit snooze five times. And you've had some good sleep. But you're not going to hear from the Lord. Like, like your prayer life, your prayer, we can't be sloppy pursuing the Lord. God deserves better than that. God deserves better than that. God deserves your best. Honor Him with your time, with your action. Show that God matters. Be intentional in your time with the Lord. Jesus got up before the sun. Jesus went out, got out of the bed, and went to an isolated place. It's like, if this is what Jesus, the Son, does, why do we think it's going to be any different for us? I just want to share, how do we value God's voice? Set an appointment. Don't be afraid to pick a time. God did it. God told Moses, I want y'all here three days from now and get yourselves ready. Be still and worship. Be still is probably our biggest problem. Be still and know that I'm God. Worship the Lord. Pray and read. Prepare. If you want to hear the voice of the Lord, you got to speak the language of the Lord. That language of the Lord is the word of the Lord. Well, I don't know if that's God. I don't know if that's God. Well, do you know the language of God? If not, you got to pray. you got to read. And then listen and write. Listen. God's word is good enough to be written down. God's word is good enough to be, to be documented. Otherwise, we're going to start forgetting and we're going to start crafting our own expectations into that. Now, on the flip side, as we round this up, it says, later, Simon and the others went out to find him. What that reads to me is, like, Peter probably slept in because it said later, they went out to find him. Like, we can't be sloppy in our pursuit. We can't get up later and get with the boys and go looking for Jesus and expect to find him. You see, the crazy part was Jesus is praying to the Father in a moment of intimacy. And, and Peter and the disciples actually walk into this atmosphere. Like Jesus and God the Father are communicating. And they walk into this atmosphere. And they miss it. They miss the encounter with God the Father. Like they step into the room and something special is happening. And they miss it. You know what they say? Instead of falling on their face, like when, when God told Moses, take them sandals off. This is holy ground. You know what these guys do? Hey, hey, hey. Everybody's looking for you. Where you been, Jesus? Everybody's looking for you. Hurry and worry was all they cared about. Why? Because the world's looking for you. They missed that encounter with God. Don't let the hurry and the worry and the world saying, hey, I need you today. I need you to call me back now. Don't let that interfere in your encounter with God. Honor God's word. And then we finish, and, and Mark says in 138, he goes, but Jesus replied, we must go on to the other towns as well. I will preach to them too. This is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. See, We've got to do what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to preach. He didn't come to just set up shop in one little place and everybody come to see some Jesus. He got up to go out to share the gospel. He got up to go out and to heal. He got up to go out, as he said, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. This is what Jesus came to do. We should all have a heart for evangelism. We should all have a heart for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you, when we go out there, it's going to require healing. It's going to require deliverance. It's going to require boldness. It's going to require faith. Like, this is what Jesus came to do. This is what he's called us to do. This is the Great Commission. Like, the, really, the one thing that I want to, I just really want to impress upon you is that you have the power. But Satan tells you that you don't. Satan tells you that your life's a mess. Satan tells you that you're too young. 
Satan tells you that, that, you know, your marriage isn't that solid or your money's not that solid. Well, you know your family history. I mean, like, you post something on Facebook about Jesus and they're going to trace your family tree back to that time that that thing happened. Remember that? That thing we're all embarrassed about? That skeleton in the closet that we'd rather keep? See, that's what the devil does. He keeps that old skeleton on a hook and he rattles it. Anytime the Lord gives you inspiration, motivation, revelation, the devil's going to take that old skeleton out of the closet. But that ain't you no more. That's part of your testimony. You're right. That's who I was. That's not who I am. You are filled with the power of God. It's got nothing to do with your physical strength or your intellectual aptitude. It's got nothing to do with your money. It is all the Holy Spirit's indwelling. I want you to know I want you to experience how powerful you are in Christ. I want you to experience that Kratos power. That when Jesus simply said, look, there wasn't a light show, there wasn't a company music, there was he just said, I'm he. Over 600 elite soldiers fell down as dead. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. You can speak that same power to the problems in your life. You can speak that same power over dry bones. You can speak that power into health, into into finances, into relationships, into dreams, into ministry. You got the power. I'm encouraging you to use that power. My assignment for you this week is look for opportunities to release that Kratos power into the life of someone else that healing, that deliverance, that encouragement, that gospel's testimony.